Hello, and welcome to the ELECT webinar on Library of Congress BibFrame Pilot Phase 2. This is the first in our series of six webinars on From Mark to BibFrame Linked Data on the Ground Enhanced. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Um, I'm sorry if you give me just a second. We are having some difficulties with our screen. Okay, there we are. Thank you for that delay. Sorry about that. Um, so today we'll have four presenters Sally McCollum, Judith Cannon, Jody Williamson and Paul Frank, all four from the Library of Congress. Sally McCollum manages the standards office responsible for the BibFrame vocabulary and the development of the system and tools, software, conversion of data, and the BibFrame editor that enable the pilot catalogers to create BibFrame descriptions. Her office works closely with COIN in the organization and running of the pilots. Judith Cannon manages the program for cooperative cataloging and bib frame pilot training. She is responsible for making certain that the suggestions and experiences of those in the bib frame pilot entering the metadata reach the persons developing bib frame to assure its continuous development and refinement. Jody Williamson is a senior technical metadata standards specialist in the network development and mark standards office at the Library of Congress. She is the BibFrame editor profile contact at the library and works with the library's developers and BibFrame pilot participants. Jody joined the library in 2017. And Paul Frank is the coordinator for the NACO and SACO programs and the authority components of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging, or the PCC. Paul is also one of the Library of Congress BibFrame pilot trainers and is a liaison to pilot participants for cataloging and technical aspects of the pilot. This group brings much expertise to today's topic, and we are fortunate to have them with us. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-T-S-C-E. We do not monitor that Twitter feed, though, so if you have questions for our presenters, please be sure to type them into that question box on your screen in the GoToWebinar panel. This webinar is being, we will, we will have time for Q&A after the presentation, and this webinar is being recorded, and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now we'll turn it over to Paul. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Hi, everyone. Um, this is Paul Frank. Hope you can hear me okay. Hope you can also see my screen. It's the first uh, opening slide for our presentation. I want to thank Erin and her colleagues, and especially Alex, for letting us have this opportunity to talk about what we're doing at the Library of Congress with BibFrame as we are working through our second pilot. It was a real pleasure for us to address uh, this group through Alex, thanks to Alex, back in October. 2016, uh, talking about our first pilot, and I'm particularly excited to, to share some of the um, advancements that we've made with uh, pilot phase two. Uh, Aaron did a great job of, of introducing us, but you can see on this slide a little thumbnail photograph of each of us, and I just wanted to um, talk in a little bit more detail about how we will proceed through today's presentation. We'll be in this order see on the slide here. Um, my colleague Sally McCallum will talk about the status of the BibFrame 2.0 pilot, and then she will pass the microphone on to Judith Cannon, who will talk about the goals for phase two of our BibFrame pilot, and then Judith will pass the phone on to, or the mic on to Jody, who will show you the editor, and then um, Jody will pass the 
the uh, microphone to me, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about our midframe database. That's something I'm, I'm really excited about. So um, I'm going to make sure I can turn up the volume just a bit in case you can hear me. And I seem to have things at max, so I um, just have to do a better job of speaking more loudly. Um, yeah, I got, I have every, you know what, here we, I can try this. I'm holding, I have uh, a handheld phone right now. What we can try, if you want to experiment, let me go to the speaker phone and see if that works any better. I know it's going to create a small echo, but it might be a little bit better for people to hear. Is that, is that any better in spite of the echo? No, that's worse. Okay. Okay, sorry. I'm going to, I think what we'll do, I'll just have to ask my, uh, I'll try to speak a little bit more loudly and clearly, and I'll ask the same of our, our presenters today. I hope, I, that, I hope that works. Um, so let me now pass the um, phone over to Sally McCallum, who will talk about the status of where we are with Jim Frame 2.0. Good afternoon, and I hope that I'll get a message on the screen or something if you can't hear me, because that's very important. Uh, so, uh, some of you may have heard our report, and I believe it was like about October of 2016 when we were reporting on the first pilot. And now we're in the middle of our second pilot, and uh, a lot of revision to what we, but based on what we learned in the first pilot, has gone on to, to uh, be able to mount this second pilot. And I'm going to give you some background on what that revision was. Uh, the first thing we had to do was uh, to uh, adjust the model that we were using. I, the screen does not show the earlier model, but I can tell you that the, what was added was that we added a, uh, as a main uh, kind of uh, entity, the item level. We had treated those as annotations in the first model. And uh, that uh, was an interesting idea. It was a good thing to have tried, but we didn't think it worked out well. Uh, and then we also have, highlight, have uh, elevated, I say, I would guess, event. So th this was at the behest of our audiovisual area that, uh, that find events as a very important uh, data element for them. So events are, as you see, attached to works, can be attached to works. Uh, the model remains, however, innovative, I think, innovative and simple. Uh, it works, which uh, include the Ferber RDA work and expression. It's instances, which are the Ferber RDA manifestations, and items which correspond somewhat to the uh, Ferber RDA items. Okay. Um, so we had about five steps we had to take to get ready for, uh, the, to have catalogers actually start using and, and, and implement this pilot. First one was the overhaul of the uh, VibFrame vocabulary. We call it the VibFrame 2.0 vocabulary uh, because we did do a lot of change based on uh, the uh, comments from the catalogers, based on comments that were coming from the community, based on some analyses that some PCC members did. Uh, it was uh, a, a lot of uh, input that we tried to uh, use in order to improve the vocabulary. Uh, and mind you, when I say vocabulary, I mean the, essentially it's, it's like your data elements, uh, your fields and subfields that you have in MARC. Uh, we also, I must say that we have a heavier influence of RDA in this vocabulary. It, that is a somewhat a slippery slope, though, because we don't know what rules change. Uh, in fact, the RDA is in the process of changing. And so we don't, we don't, we're wary of being too tightly uh, tied to any one set of rules or specifications. Uh, then we had to do specifications for the conversion of MARC to BibFrame because we needed to be able to bring our data that we had in MARC forward. Uh, fortunately, in MARC, there are a lot of patterns that you can uh, latch on to, uh, the, the, uh, the way a, a name is given in the 1XX fields or <coughs> C 
6XX deals or the 7XX deals is always the same. And so we, we that eased our the transition. On the other hand, there is a lot of duplication in MARC. Uh, we, uh, and we had to reconcile that when we do a straight conversion of a record, we end up with a dead element being converted from several different places in MARC. It'll be the same thing, so then we have to bring them together in our ship train uh, uh, file. Uh, we have different forms of expression in MARC. We, we will sometimes give a data element as a code, and then we'll give it as a uh, text uh, string, and we may even include it in a sentence. And so there are just different ways that they can be expressed, and, and that is a, a, a conversion nightmare to some extent. And then there are also what I call uh, there's an abundance of data in MARC. Uh, MARC is uh, almost 60 years old, and it has been added to and added to and added to over the years as as um, we needed to do what we needed to do these things as the uh, calendar rules changed, the conventions people were using changed, uh, we had new ideas about things, and so we uh, uh, we have uh, we had to make some decisions on some of the data. Do we try to convert every little piece of data? Or do we leave some of it behind? Uh, do we uh, uh, say that it's, it's in the format three different ways? We're only going to convert it from this one one place. We won't convert it from the other places. So those are the kinds of decisions we had to actually come to grips with. Then the next thing was to do actual conversion programs. And I must say we, we had that done on contract by a company called Index Data, which uh, uh, did a marvelous job of, of making a mark to bit frame conversion for us, and it, it's held up very well through uh, a lot of work in the last year and a half. And after we had the, after we converted though the, all the 19 million records that we needed to convert, we had to merge and reconcile the data because, uh, as you know, we have uh, we have mark records in the authority formats for uh, that are really work descriptions. Then we had bibliographic records, and we have to split. We split the bibliographic records so that they had some elements went to a work description, and some of them went to an instance description, or a manifestation, as RDA would call it, and a description. And so we had to, and then we had to merge these things together because you ended up with if a, an item had uh, uh, it was all belonged to the same work, you had multiple versions of the work, you had multiple versions of the subjects and you had to uh, merge and match and reconcile all that data. It has been a, it is a not ending, non-ending task for us because we continue to do it today. So our goal, once we had, we got to this point and we had our data uh, converted, our goal was to have a realistic cataloging environment. And so we had the catalogers, uh, whereas on the first pilot, they first input their mark record, and then they went over to the BibFrame system, and they input the same data into the BibFrame system. But in this pilot, we had them do the BibFrame work first. They did their BibFrame data, and then they went over and did their mark data. They do have to do the mark data. We could not get away from that because uh, many of you use our MARC data, and you're not, you're not uh, able to use our BibFrame data, and we have to continue to supply those records to everyone. Besides that, we have many subsystems in the Library of Congress that also use our MARC data, and they are not, at this point, they certainly cannot use the BibFrame data. So we had to be able to uh, keep uh, the uh, database of record in MARC. Uh, so we, in doing the conversion, we converted around 17 million MARC bibliographic records into BibFrame works, instances, and items. Now those are the bibliographic records. Then we took the authority records, the title authority records, 1.2 million, and converted those to BibFrame works. Then we merged and matched all those, and we, as I said in the end of the last slide, we continue to refine that. Uh, frankly, every day here. The, uh, 
another thing that had to go on for us to be able to do the second pilot was we had to revamp the uh, Big Frame Editor. Uh, we had lessons from the first pilot about the editor. We had to update all the profiles. Uh, we had to enable the in we wanted to enable the input of new name authorities into the BibFrame system, which had not been possible with the first pilot. But if we were going to have a uh, uh, environment that simulated, that truly simulated what the cataloger would do, they need to be able to input authorities as they were doing their bibliographic record into the BibFrame system. Uh, Jody and Paul will be talking a lot more about the editor later. We also had to expand uh, our link data service. It's, we, we call it various things. We call it LDS, link data service. We call it ID. We call it, it the address is id.lsc.gov. Uh, we needed to add more terms and list, because the editor wanted these, we, we needed these to, um, for drop downs and for type aheads. And we needed drop down some type aheads in the editor because we want cleaner data, we want to have faster input, and we want to never have to type a URI. So that's, we did a lot of work with respect to that, that system. Uh, we had also a, a special task that we had to do, and that was a, a, actually a complete restructuring of our infrastructure uh, for the uh, system. It, it had been uh, very difficult uh, because it's a very large system, but uh, it, it now, um, at, at sort of finally the complete, more or less completion, we never finished with that task either, uh, but more or less the completion, we are, uh, we have a much more ro robust system and it, uh, it is much more of a pleasure to work with. And then there was the documentation and training, and uh, Paul will probably be saying something about that. Uh, we had, um, uh, 40 pilot participants in the first pilot, and we had added 20 more in the second pilot, so they had to retrain some of the first pilot participants and into the new editor, the new vocabulary, and new, new features, and they had to completely train the 20 new. So where are we? We have, at, at this point, we have 60 catalogers in our pilot. We started the pilot last summer, and uh, it, we have uh, incrementally added, uh, adjusted and added features to it for the last six months. Uh, we do all forms of material, which makes it even more of a challenge because you think you've got it worked out for books, and you find that AV people just can't, can't uh, deal with the, uh, the data elements the way you've structured them. Uh, we have continuous, we continuously discover and fix conversions and mergers in the in the pilot. Uh, we uh, find that uh, we, even though we very carefully made our specifications for the conversion of the mark records, and we very carefully made the conversion programs, we sometimes didn't do them right, and we discovered that, and we have to fix that, and we have to fix records that had been converted previously. I might add here that, that the conversion from MARC to BibFrame is not, was not a one-time and never would be a one-time uh, event because while we converted the back file at first, it, today we have 60 catalogers who input to BibFrame directly and so they do not do, uh, we do not convert their records, but we have another 240 catalogers at the Library of Congress who continue happily making their MARC records and we have to convert those daily and add them to the BibFrame database so that the BibFrame catalogers will always have an up-to-date database to catalog against. Uh, we also have been doing con uh, a continuous adjustment of, of the editor. Editors are not easy to um, uh, construct and uh, there are a lot of different uh, points of view with respect to how they should operate, and so we have been trying a lot of things. This is the time to do that, though. This is the time to not say, okay, it's done, and this is what you get. This is the time to say what, what, is, what would be interesting, let's try it, and then see how it works out. So LCC these pilots is essential for understanding the future. These are the two 
here are two key motivations. The migration of MARC to a new platform and libraries as part of the linked data environment. Those are the two motivations for what we're doing in the whole BibBrain project. Now I'm going to turn the webinar over to Judith Cannon, who's going to talk a little bit more about goals, the library's goals with this pilot. Right, I'm in position now. This is Judith Cannon. Can you hear me all right? I'm going to assume that you can. I know I have a voice like a foghorn, so I'm hoping it's all right with you. Uh, I'm going to discuss the goals. Uh, Sally just ended with the motivation, and um, without that motivation, we'd never achieve our goals. But we have a number of goals, and they come from three main sources. One is the ABA director, Beecher Wiggins. Um, the other is from the Network Development and Mark Standards Office, which is um, presided over by Sammy McCallum. And the third is the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division that I preside over. And then um, there are some goals that um, MDS, MDMSO and COIN need to work together on to achieve them. Let's take a look at the director's goals. The first one is probably the most important. What we need to know is can any institution apply this frame? Is it large enough and um, is, it, is it robust enough to hand a large, handle a large and very complex body of data? That's the key. And that is what um, we're hoping to find out in phase two. Is this possible? Now, if it is possible, and it's proved that it can handle a large and complex body of data, it's robust enough, then the Library of Congress has to make a decision. Will it pursue BibFrame as its linked data pathway, which would then make it the ultimate replacement for Mars? Now, once the library has made its decision with regard to this, then, of course, it wants to announce it. Now, the goals of um, Network Development and Mark Standards Office and the Cooperative and Instructional um, Design um, Division fold into the director's goals. And we need to achieve our goals in order for him to reach these decisions. Now, Sally has already spoken to you about a number of the things that are, the, um, that are on this uh, PowerPoint in front of you right now. Uh, but one of the key things is providing a realistic cataloging environment for the big frame pilot participants. And they have worked very hard to do this. They've made a lot of changes between phase one and phase two. I can honestly say that um, those participants in phase two are very happy and pleased with um, the changes that are being made. Do they want more? Oh, yes. Um, are they pushing for more? Yes. But um, as Sally said earlier in her presentation, this is ongoing. Um, it will never sort of be finished. It's just like RDA. We're always making changes to RDA. But this frame is going to be a living um, database and there will always be changes and expansions to it. Um, the database conversion, uh, I think um, I want to say something that Sally didn't say, um, and that is that under phase one, we only managed to convert 12 million of um, the records in the ILS Voyager database. This time we converted the entire database that was a huge achievement, and um, I think that um, NDMSO deserves a lot of kudos for that. Uh, the last three she spoke to about in great detail, so I and I know that Jody will be talking about them more, and Paul will probably touch on them. So I'm not going to belabor the point. Um, of course, our primary goal, the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division primary goal, was to train participants. 
to train the, and we did this in two phases. We trained those that had been in part of one first, and then we trained those that were um, coming in for part of two and had no exposure to this rain. Uh, the goals that we've set, the four that are down below, are goals that the catalogers are pushing us to get achieved for them. So they are driving our goals. And one, of course, is that they want to be able to save what they do in the frame um, database. They want to be able to retrieve it, and they want to be able to edit it. And um, they now have these functions. They want to be able to import um, external bibliographic records, and this is being explored. So they're very happy about that. Um, then um, native BibFrame descriptions are being added to the BibFrame database. Now, the issue of romanization in the bibliographic, um, of bibliographic data is um, bubbling to the surface right now, and we're going to start meetings on this uh, next week. And then this is the um, final slide of goals. And it's the combined COIN MDMSO goals. COIN and MDMSO staff meet once a week um, on Tuesdays to discuss possible changes and improvements to BibFrame to keep driving it forward. Uh, and neither one of us can achieve these two goals that are on this page without the help of the other. And we have um, a really first-class um, working relationship. And I think for those of us that have a cataloging background rather than a programming background, um, this partnership has been a very rewarding and enlightening experience. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jody to um, give you some more details. Thank you, Judith. So, um, as I said in the bio, I just joined the library in 2017, so I am the newest member of the BibFrame project team. And, oops, sorry, I'm going to talk about uh, the editor. And the editor that has been created for this pilot is a browser-based app, um, so there is no uh, special software that our catalogers have needed to download onto their workstations. And here are some of the features that are included in the editor. We've tried to have a lot of pre-populated data to cut down on duplication and typing so that for standardized vocabulary terms, the, the list is there. And as Sally and Judith both mentioned, we don't have to type in URIs directly. We have lots of type ahead options for longer lists because the catalogers are able to search the entire BibFrame database when they're looking for a work in the event that they are nearly just um, attaching an instance to an existing work. They don't have to type in all of the work information again. Then for the shorter lists, we have put in new vocabularies into id.lsc.gov so that we have access to uh, locally constructed URIs. Based on, I believe, feedback from the first pilot, there's a lot of hot linking out to the RDA toolkit. We will see how this uh, changes when the toolkit redesign is published this summer. We are continuing to work with the pilot participants and refine the editor profiles to better meet their needs. When you're ready to catalog in the app, you have the option of um, you start by selecting the format of the material that you are going to catalog. You can then choose to either begin with an instance or a work. Here are some pieces of the uh, input screens that the catalogers see. They are it's very incomplete. There are a lot more fields that are not listed here. So this is an instance of a monograph. And it shows some of the drop-down options where we do pre-supply defaults that work 95% of the time for the material. Uh, for instance, that for a monograph, the mode of issuance is a single unit. And for a monograph, the media type is usually unmediated. You'll also see that a lot of the information on this screen is in Hebrew. 
the romanized form of the title is the input as the transliterated title, but the rest of the descriptive information is input as Hebrew. We are exploring uh, the reduction of duplicate entry in terms of the native script and the, trans and the uh, romanized script as a part of the pilot. This is the instance for a DVD. It has a lot of similarities to the monograph instance page that we just saw. There's title, there's the statement of responsibility, the, and the publication information. But farther down in that DVD profile, there are a lot of unique fields that are just for DVDs. We're really focused on making each profile as unique to the materials being cataloged as possible and hopefully reducing the amount, the number of fields that are not needed. We've reviewed the profiles with the pilot participants and we've customized many sections for them. For example, this is uh, the item record in input for a monograph. It's fairly standard in terms of a holding, a shelf mark, um, a URL, sublocations for within the Voyager system, barcodes, notes, lending policies, enumeration, and chronology. But this is the item that has been created for our rare book cataloger. Based on her input, we added in a lot of fields that are not generally considered part of an item but are very important for rare materials, like the agents associated with the item, the former genre of the item, and the immediate source of acquisition information is a bit more detailed. Uh, this is all based on feedback from our rare materials pilot participants. And Sally had mentioned our drop-down options. And here are two examples. The first one for language is coming straight from the full mark code list for languages that has been part of the ID database for a long time. The second one, broadcast standard, is actually the terms that are were defined in the RDA registry and we have loaded them locally for use in the pilot. The subject search will search the Library of Congress subject headings and the Library of Congress name authority file simultaneously so that the cataloger can choose which heading they really need. And the form and genre search is only searching the Library of Congress genre format terms vocabulary. And once the data has been input into the editor and then saved into the BibFrame database, so this, the, uh, here's some examples of how the data is stored. So on the top one, where we have the language, we have both the um, URI for language code BZZ, and we also have the human-friendly label that says no linguistic content. The second one is sound content, which is the same thing. We have the URI for the vocabulary that we added, which was sound content, and then there's the label for sound. The bottom one is the title example, and you'll see that its node ID is a blank node, and this is used to group together uh, materials that do not have, that lack a URI. The um, entire output of a record in BigBrain is very wordy, and that's why we're only showing examples. And now Paul is going to discuss the training. Thanks, Jody. Actually, um, I thought it would be fun to pretend like we're all big frame pilot participants and um, this will give me an opportunity to talk about one of my favorite parts of this pilot and that's the, uh, the incredible developments that we've made with our big frame database. Okay, so we can call it a um, many different things and since this is so new, we're still deciding, you know, what, what's best. At, at first, when we started working with the participants last summer, we called it the link data database, or we could call it a triple store, but we decided to call it the big frame database for now. Who knows, that might change in the future, but, but it's a big part of the pilot and there are three particular areas I want to focus on right now. One is the conversion processes. You know, how, how, do, how do descriptions end up in the BigFrame database? Where do they come from? And how are they identified once they are in the BigFrame database? 
the changes that are taking place in the BitFrame database are minute by minute. This is something that's constantly changing. Um, a lot of the changes are based on comments we receive from participants. A lot of the changes are based on issues that the technical staff in NDMSO have, have determined. But I have to say overall, it's been a wonderful process. It's very hard to work with a moving target, but we've done really well in this part of the pilot with the, um, with the changes that we see. So what you see on the screen here is MARC. Okay, well, we've talked a lot about MARC, but now let's see what happens when you take MARC and you convert it to big frames. Sally mentioned in her part of the presentation that MARC data often includes different attributes, different elements from other vocabularies. So for any of you who are uh, familiar with RDA, just by looking at this slide, this MARC record, you can see work elements, expression elements, and manifestation elements all in one, in one MARC record. So this record in our OPAC, in our LC Library of Congress database, was cataloged um, probably in 2015, and, and that might have been before our first BitFrame pilot even began. So here, here's an older MARC record that existed before BibFrame. Sally mentioned that all 18 million records, bibliographic records from our OPAC, the LC OPAC, were converted to BibFrame. So that means that this one was a candidate for conversion to BibFrame. The view you see on this slide shows you a view of the BibFrame database that our participants see. So I like to think of this really as a cataloging module, not so much a discovery layer. This is the, these, these are the internal workings that, that the pilot participants and the BibFrame developers see. But I, I put a little box around this description under number one here, where you see work from Bib. This identifies the source of this description in the BibFrame database. This description came from a bibliographic record in the MARC database. Now, think about this. If you're catalogers, you know that you can identify works in MARC bibliographic records. You also can identify works by using authority records. So this little bit of provenance information is critical to everyone working in the database to find out how descriptions uh, reach the database. So let's, on the next slide, you'll see sort of an atomized view of that MARC record that we saw two slides back. On the left-hand side of the view here, you see the work elements. These were extracted from that MARC record as big frame work elements. The instance information, or we could call it manifestation information in RDA, is linked here on the right side of the screen. So what entered the BibFrame database as one MARC description ended up as a BibFrame work and a BibFrame instance. And all of this was done through conversion processes. This was not done by a cataloger. So there are other sources of provenance in the BibFrame database, and I'm just showing three on this slide here. Here's an example of a work that was added to the BibFrame database through the conversion of the name title authority file, or, or title or name title authority file. Think if you're a NACO member, a NACO record for a work converted to BibFrame. Now this is an easier one because this is work to work. The second one says work stub from BIB, and that's an odd way to describe it, but it's actually an accurate description because this work description came from a, perhaps a 7XX, a title added entry in a bibliographic work. There's not much other information other than the title, but still it is a valid big frame work. A cataloger working in the pilot will know, aha, this came from a bibliographic record. It was a, um, just an access point in a bibliographic record. And perhaps I would like to take that work stub and update it to add more element work elements to, to make it a much fuller description. And that's something that our big friend pilot participants will be able to do. Finally, this last one is a work that was added to the big frame database um, 
by one of our bid frame participants. And uh, this one I want to walk through with you in a little bit greater detail so, so you get an idea of what our participants are doing as they work in the pilot. So Jody did a wonderful job of showing you the editor, and here I'm back to the editor. In, in this case, I'm creating a new bib frame work for an opera by um, Martinu. And this is a record that was created by one of our uh, bib frame participants who works with sound recording. So we're, we're dealing with the sound recording. The cataloger would have done all the description in the bib frame editor that he needed to do. And then he would have saved that record in the editor. And Jody showed you uh, in one of her slides the, the fuller view of the, um, the RDF and the catalogers. We, we were very surprised in phase one, and that continues into phase two, are actually very good at looking at the RDF and, and uh, testing to make sure that everything looks okay there. Not only, so not only in the area where they're filling in information in the editor, but also in the result of the RDF from their, from their description. But when the cataloger is happy with the description of this work, it's time to post it so that it migrates to the BigFrame database. And the posting is done by clicking on that, that, that box there that says post that has the arrow to the right of it. At that point, it goes through a conversion uh, in, in, in live time. There's no way it, it happens, starts right away. And there's a, a minimal amount of validation that takes place. And when that validation is completed, if everything looks okay, the record is, or the description is added to the BigFrame database and the cataloger gets this uh, green colored uh, box around the, the identifier for the resource to show that yes, the, uh, the resource is now in the BigFrame database. So we can do just like we did with that marked record at the beginning of the uh, of my part of the presentation. Once that description is added to the BibFrame editor uh, to the BibFrame database, you can identify the, the separate parts. Here's the work, and there's an instance connected to that. So it's no different from the marked record that was converted through automated processes. But thinking back to that marked record that was added through automated processes and as part of converting the 18 million bibliographic records in our database, now our cataloger, who our test uh, participant here who created this uh, opera description, is required to create a, a mark description for that resource as well, because mark still is our database of record. We're just experimenting with BibFrame, but our live database is still based in MARC. So what's going to prevent the MARC description for this resource from going into the BibFrame database as well and creating a duplicate? Well, our catalogers working in uh, MARC will add a local field that you see highlighted here. It says BibFrame Pilot 2, and it gives the date that the, the, um, the 985 field was added, and that field will suppress the record from migrating to the BibFrame database. So that means that the native BibFrame description that that cataloger created that we walked through earlier in this presentation becomes the master record in the BibFrame database, and the MARC description for that resource will not migrate to the BibFrame database. Because of all of these different streams of data coming into the BibFrame database, it's important for us to be able to search on the different types of sources. And uh, that's why I like to think of the BibFrame database view as really a cataloging module, not something that a, that a patron would use, but something that catalogers and developers need to see. So you'll see some very unusual filterings that can be done on Bib, in our BibFrame database. We can filter on uh, different types of resources, but we can also filter on the sources, whether they came from 
a bid record, whether they came from an authority record, whether they're a stub record, as we saw earlier, or whether they're a native boot frame description. So we're finding in, our, in the pilot at this point that these options have given us a lot of information about how our data is getting into the bid frame database, but also gives us a lot more control over how we can search in the bid frame database to find the words that we need to um, access. So I'm going to pass the, the uh, mic back to Jody now for a closing couple of slides, and then we'll take questions and answers. So Paul did a really good job showing our internal database. The unfortunate thing is that it's not available to the public outside of the Library of Congress network. But we do have some tools that are available for you to explore with yourself to see how data would look in the linked data format. And the first one is the bid frame comparison tool where you can go to the above URL, put in your um, LCCN, so pick a book that you pick your favorite book, get its LCCN, put that number in here, and it will be converted to a side-by-side -side view. It's hard to show it accurately in a PowerPoint slide because of the length of these uh, data output, but here's an, here's an example. So on the upper left, we have a MARC record, and I've circled MARC tag 347, which says subfield A, audio file, subfield B, CD audio, and subfield 2, RDA. And on the lower part of the screen is the output of this MARC record in bib frame using um, the turtle serialization, which is a little more um, user-friendly than a straight XML output. And where I've circled, you have the bib frame file type, which is the bib frame class that's been assigned that the data from our tag 347 was converted to. And you see the label that says audio file. The source is the data from subfield 2, and it says RDA. Right now, the conversion just takes the text from subfield A and puts it into an RDFS label field. But we are going to be changing the conversion specifications to assign URIs to these terms because in a lot of the 3.4x fields, there are fields, there are a lot of elements that use standardized vocabularies, and so the conversion program can do the translation. And finally, we have uh, through the loc.gov slash bid frame site you can look at many aspects of our project. You can see our vocabulary in several different output formats. You can uh, uh, look at our current conversion specs for mark bib to bib frame and mark authority to bib frame. You can download from GitHub the conversion programs if you'd like to mount them locally and convert some of your own data. And you can use the comparison viewer that I just outlined above. And with that, we will turn it over for questions. All right. Thank you, Jody, and thank you, everyone. This was a really informative session. Um, so as I said, we do have time for questions now. You can go ahead and enter them into the question box if you haven't already. We do expect we're going to get more questions than we have time to answer today, but our presenters have kindly offered to answer the remaining questions in writing. So if you don't get to our, if we don't get to your question, you'll receive an email with that answer within a couple of days. Um, and I'm also going to be combining some of the questions, so pay attention, um, listen up, maybe combining your question with someone else's as it makes sense. Um, so first off, just kind of an easier one, we have a couple of questions about acronyms. Um, would you be able to define briefly what ABA and RDF stand for? Oh. Um, this is Judith. Um, ABA stands for Acquisitions and Bibliographic Access Directorate, and um, Beach Wiggins is the director. Is that sufficient? Yeah, that's great. And then just RDF? I'm going to let um, somebody else handle the RDF. <laughs> I think Sally would like to. Just a second. And RDF is the resource description for, for, framework, and that's a, a World Wide Web Consortium, WC3, uh, 
definition, I guess you'd call it, or a concept, and it's a, it's a, a, a format that was developed by them, and we felt that it was it, and it's used in the web a great deal, and so we thought it was important to, in fact, follow in the footsteps of, of what was being used more widely in the web. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have a number of questions about the pilot project BibFrame database. Um, are, we're wondering what system or ILS was used, and we know that Jody said it's not available for others at this point as kind of a testing environment, but will there be a version that can you be used by other libraries that can work with other ILSs, whether it's open source or vendor provided? Next generation, we don't have any uh, so this is Jody. The BibFrame database is not um, connected to any ILS system at all. It's a locally constructed database. It's built on top of the MarkLogic uh, semantic database that was created to store all of the BibFrame descriptions. As far as future development, I think that we would be curious what other libraries and other library systems are going to develop. Um, the database that we are searching on and looking at is very helpful internally, but it, I don't really think it has an application outside of the pilot. And Sally has some more comments to add. I must say that, that uh, we have been looking into how we might make the uh, converted records, the BibFrame database, uh, 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 downloadable to another system. That does not mean you would interact with the database at our system, but it would enable other people to mount it and use it as a background file for what they wanted to do. Uh, we're not, we haven't got that ready yet, but we are looking into it. All right, great, thank you. And we have a question about authorities. Um, so in the editor, is it pre-populated with all LOC authorities, or is it a live API that's tapping into Library of Congress authorities? You, you too. <laughs> Sorry, we're passing the phone around. I, what I can tell you from, first of all, is that the, the authority data that you see in the BibFrame database is only title. So title, think 130, or 1XXAT, you know, name, title, or title, that's all. We did not convert the, the name, personal name, authority records, corporate name, jurisdictions. However, those are searchable as access points through id.loc.gov. Now, what we did do in phase two as um, a, a exploratory move was to have our catalogers input data, let, let me call it agent data. Everyone knows what an agent is if you're a cataloger, right? The, the persons, families, corporate bodies, the, the names that, that we use in RDA descriptions. Um, those we can input into the editor using the prof a profile very similar to the one that Jody showed you. However, we're just testing that data. That data is not going anywhere. In the future, who knows? That might be a, a, an input mechanism to have data uh, migrate to id.loc.gov. We don't know that yet. We're just testing that. But the, um, the complete NACO authority file is searchable in BibFrame, but the conversion into the BibFrame database is only from titles and name titles in the uh, name authority file. And, and um, sorry, and Sally has one thing to add. In other words, the uh, uh, RDF, the, the names are in RDF in the ID system, and the BibFrame uh, database links out to the ID system, which is uh, what one might see in a future system that is based on RDF, is that you would link out from various authorities to other systems. Great, thank you. Um, next, we have a couple of questions regarding romanization. Um, I wonder if you could speak some more about what's being done to reduce the workload for catalogers who right now are working with parallel romanization and vernacular entries, um, such as the Hebrew instance you showed. Well, what, what we were doing as an experiment in 
Big Frame Pilot Phase 2 with catalogers who work with non-Latin scripts is have those catalogers provide romanization only for access points. For any transcribed data, the description is in the, the native script, as, as you saw in the slide that Jody um, had in her part of the presentation. Judith mentioned an internal group that's discussing how we can proceed with this. Now, you know, we're very early into this, and, and, and the nice thing about having BibFrame is that it's not a database of records, so you have a little bit more leeway to experiment. What we're going to do internally at LC is discuss the results of this new approach in BibFrame and see how that might move us into the future. There are no answers yet, but I will tell you that the catalog, the catalogers, I'm not speaking about users, I'm talking about catalogers, have been very pleased with the, the ease in which they can just use the native script and not have to pair so many fields like they do now. Now, you know, the, the jury is out on, on how users would react to that or, or vendors or, or other people in the community, and that's what our internal LC group is going to be looking at starting next week. Great, great. thank you. Um, so the next one is, based on what you've learned from the pilot project, is it likely that LC will recommend replacing Mark with BibFrame in the near future? Um, this is Judith. Um, I talked about the goals, and this was a goal. I have no idea what is on the minds of anyone other than the goals that I was given. I know that all of us in um, the Cooperative and Instructional Programs Division and in the Network Development and Mark Standards Office are working to try and achieve the goals of the director so that LC can make a decision. But what LC's decision will be and when it will be made, I have absolutely no idea. All right, thank you. And then we have time for one more question. And we have a couple attendees who are really new to BibFrame. And so we're wondering if you could just mention a few resources, direct them somewhere where they can find out more. There we go. So there are a couple options. Um, the first would be uh, loc.gov slash bibframe, which is the central location of all bibframe information from the library. And there's also um, information on the Program for Cooperative Cataloging webpage, which is www.loc.gov slash ABA slash PCC slash bibframe. <laughs> and I um, if you're interested in more about linked data and you have the um, budget for it, I would really recommend the linked data course sequence that the Library Juice Academy offers. It helped me a great deal personally. All right, great. Thanks to all four of you. Um, so we do have quite a few questions left. So as I mentioned before, don't be alarmed, we'll send you your answers in writing, um, as well as for those of you that just asked to re-see a slide or a link again, you will receive the slide deck shortly after the presentation as well, so you'll have access to everything that our presenters showed you today. Um, so I'd like to give another thanks to our presenters. Um, well, thanks to Sally, Judy, Judith, Jody, and Paul. Um, and thank you to the Elect Continuing Education Committee, um, Catherine Balick, Iping Chengafi, and Jazz Cooley from the Elect Office. The support that they provide us with makes these webinars possible. Uh, we do have other continuing education events coming up. Uh, our next webinar is on March 24th. Um, I'm sorry, our next mention webinar is on March 14th with the second session in a two-part series on Vivo and the role of librarians. So please see the ELECTS website to register or to find more information on these. 
and Elect also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. And our next e-form will take place on March 20th. This will cover issues in cataloging and metadata education. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you to all our attendees for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.